Hey, my name's Tom and welcome back to Low Carbon Lifestyle. In this episode, let me tell you a little bit about a trip I had a couple of months ago. There might have been a bit of a clue about the future of heating in the UK. My work took me for a few days to visit Malmo in Sweden and then Copenhagen over the bridge in Denmark. And I was left pretty amazed by the things that I saw there. It's completely different to how we do things in the UK. It's something called Fjernvarmen. My name is Tom and this is a little series about a low carbon lifestyle. So what did I see in Scandinavia? Me and some colleagues got the plane from Newcastle to Copenhagen and I've done a video about flight guilt before you comment and yes, I did pay some money to offset this one too. And after the flight, we got the train across the bridge uh, uh, oh. to Malmo. We had a couple of days there before I went back to Copenhagen. I worked for a day. I had the weekend exploring the city with my wife. We had some great food. We saw some great swimming spots and we cycled all around Copenhagen. It was fantastic. Before on the Monday where I joined a wider group from the UK in seeing how Denmark does things. We were visiting a load of different projects around sustainability, but because I'm an engineer working to decarbonize heat, my focus was mainly at their approach to heat. And in many ways in both Denmark and Sweden, the approach to heat is pretty different. Much less gas infrastructure delivering gas to individual homes, but a different form of heating known as district heating. So district heating is a concept that could play a major role in the decarbonisation of heat in the UK. And if we need to replace 25 million gas boilers in homes and even more in commercial buildings whilst maintaining comfort and whilst keeping costs affordable, then maybe we need as many tools in our belt as possible. So what are district heat networks? How could they help? And what might we expect in the UK? Well, let's start with some basics. The concept of district heating is really all about how we move energy around. In a district heating network, we are moving hot water through some insulated pipes and delivering it to a heat demand. And we're moving energy in the form of that hot water instead of moving energy in the form of natural gas, as we normally do in the UK. That hot water is then piped to the building and to a heat exchanger or a heat interface unit and the energy that it deposits in that unit can then be used in a normal radiator circuit in a building. The heat interface unit could look a little bit like a normal boiler, a little white box on a wall or in a cupboard. And it works quite simply by extracting heat from the network and delivering it to a building. It doesn't burn anything, uh, at least locally, and it doesn't really have many moving parts. It doesn't have much that can go wrong. It's fairly simple. And here's the interesting question. Where does the heat come from? It doesn't just magically appear in pipes without doing something. So where do the Danes and the Swedes get it from? Well, the source of heat could be anything. It could be a big boiler burning something to generate heat. It could be waste heat in industry. It could be heat that occurs naturally in the environment around us. And the variety of heat sources sources is what makes district heating so useful and so interesting. In Sweden and Denmark I saw heat networks powered by big solar thermal collectors, by biomass boilers, by energy from waste plants and actually burning waste that we sent to them and we pay them to get rid of from the UK. It's also heat from gas boilers, from combined heat and power units and actually also from heat pumps. And all these heat sources were connected to pipe systems and deliver it, delivered heat to where it was needed. Because when pipes are in the ground, all of a sudden, heat that used to be wasted becomes a valuable resource. In the UK, the sight of cooling towers on the horizon is fairly common. Big concrete structures that condense steam and release heat, and then they cool water in a process. And that could be in a power station, sometimes it's in different industrial processes. But that heat that's given off often is a waste product. We don't really use it. We just let it off to atmosphere. And if that process was connected to a district heat network, then maybe the heat could be distributed somewhere else nearby. It could be taken from that process and used to heat a hospital or a school or a block of flats or a business park, a home. It could be used 
instead of being wasted. And it could have a really meaningful use. So to begin with, this could just seem like a really efficient use of resources. This doesn't particularly appear to, to be the solution to reduce emis emissions linked to heat. And actually, a lot, of the heat so <laughs> a lot of the heat sources I've mentioned so far are still burning stuff. Or they're using a load of energy with heat as a waste product. But because the heat network doesn't care where its heat comes from, it's an opportunity to share low carbon heat around a community. So where could we get that low carbon source of heat? Well, we could use heat pumps and we could use heat pumps that take heat from warm water in flooded mines underground, just like they're doing in Gateshead, in Tyneside and in Seaham in County Durham near me. It could look like drilling a little bit further underground and taking heat from rocks in the Earth's surface. Again, like they're exploring in Newcastle. It could be heat harvested from sunlight, like I saw in Denmark. It could be heat taken from sewage works or from a river like they do in Glasgow. It could be heat from big air source heat pumps, just heat from the air. Or it could be a mix of all of the above. If the infrastructure is in place to move heat from one place to another, the opportunities for low cost, low carbon sources of heat are huge. So how do we get the pipes in the ground? How do we get the infrastructure in place? Because last time I looked, the pavements around me were being dug up to upgrade gas pipe work, not install district heating hot water pipes. Well, actually, government and the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy has a heat networks plan. And they want to see between 18 and 20 percent of heat delivered in the UK through district heat networks. And this is probably likely to be in areas close to industrial clusters or maybe in dense urban areas where the distance between heat demand and heat source is not really that far. So it may be most likely that we're going to see heat networks offering heat to commercial buildings. But if we just assumed that 20% of homes, 20% of heat demand, that would be equivalent to 5 million homes supplied by heat networks. And that's a pretty meaningful number. So government are hoping to provoke heat networks and a whole new industry with a few different schemes. They're offering grants through the Green Heat Network Fund to help build new heat networks with low carbon heat in mind. They're also developing zoning strategy to mandate certain, area, certain areas to look to develop a heat network. And that could mean local authorities in certain parts of the country need to develop plans for using heat from one area and delivering it to another. And the government also have the Heat Networks Development Unit. And that helps fund the development of heat networks from looking at feasibility studies to doing heat mapping of areas and to performing some economic modelling. I've already mentioned the work that is underway near me in the northeast. Heat networks of varying scales to heat city centres. One already fully operational and expanding in Gateshead. Another a bit newer at the Helix site in Newcastle. Others that have been in place for decades, like the Biker Wall. There are more planned in Sunderland and in Newcastle and to heat whole communities like the CM Garden Village project at the coast of County Durham. There are rumblings of heat network investment all over the country. And with the Northeast Local Economic Partnership and their Energy Accelerator programme, who are championing around 500 million pounds worth of heat network investment in the Northeast alone, which is huge. So it's likely that many of us will have heat supplied via a heat network in the next 10 or 20 years, in schools, in workplaces, in community centres and even in our homes. Heat networks could help reduce the reliance on natural gas and promote lower carbon sources of heat. And this concept will be new to much of us in the UK, but it's really well proven in Denmark, Sweden and in other parts of Europe. And it's provided heat in the UK all over the country for many years. In the past, it might have relied on burning fossil fuels, maybe big coal or big oil boilers. But in the future, it's got the potential to provide very low carbon heat at a lower cost to other options for low carbon heating. It's an option. A heat network definitely won't be the right solution in lots of areas, particularly rural settings where buildings are spread really far apart or in communities that don't have real, really any source of waste heat. And if the aim is for 20% of heat to be delivered via heat networks, then 80% has got to come from something else. So I'm going to look at that 
in the next couple of episodes, uh, we're going to be asking that question, where else might heat come from? Will hydrogen play a role in heating in the UK? And what role does electricity play? Okay, so what do you think? Would you be happy having a community scale heating system? Would it work where you're based? And what challenges would you see where you live? Do drop me a comment below. Do hit subscribe to this channel. And if you wanna know what I think the role hydrogen might play in heating, then have a look at this video.